Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and to uh, introduce our guest, Dr. Roy Newman. Dr. Newman is a retired physician. He practiced in the Philadelphia area for over 50 years. And recently, four months ago, he retired as a member of the faculty at Jefferson Medical College, where he spent a number of years training young doctors. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Newman is a man of many parts and many interests. He's been very active in the communities in Delaware Valley. Uh, he, one of his hobbies is to be an amateur actor. He's appeared in many productions locally. He's a member of the Elkins uh, Fire Department Volunteers and organized the 100th anniversary for the Elkins Fire Department. Uh, he and his wife, Stevie, are excellent skaters. And Roy himself has been a great dancer and skater, and they perform locally. And they just retired, I believe, uh, 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 probably a month ago. <coughs> he also has been the vice president of Road Up Shalom synagogue for 15 years. Uh, over the years, Roy has received numerous awards. Uh, being a practicing physician for 50 years, he was honored by the Albert Einstein Maimonides Society. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania recognized him uh, for 50 years service as a medical doctor. Uh, in addition to that, he's been a writer. He's published many articles. Uh, in medical journals throughout the country, national articles, and his specialty was pediatrics. And his specialty within pediatrics has been pediatric diseases for young children. Getting back to the lecture today, Roy is going to talk about America's Forgotten War, the Korean War. Uh, Roy served in the Army Medical Corps, 1951-53, and spent 14 months as a combat surgeon in a mass unit. I'll let him carry on now, and without further ado, a very warm and caring gentleman, my friend, Roy. Thank you, Mike. Blockade of Berlin by the Russians. 
In September 1949, the Soviets tested their first atomic bomb. In October 1948, China, the world's most populous nation, 1.3 billion, became communistic when Chiang Kai-shek was forced off the mainland into Taiwan. So began the reasons for a conflict that many today call the Forgotten War. Why was it forgotten? It was a war that was unwelcome after the recent horrible losses of World War II. Another reason it was far away in Asia, and we were connected to the European continent, but Asia was a more unknown, more distant place in the minds of Americans. There was almost no TV coverage at that time, so the magnitude of the war was unappreciated. The government elected to call it a police action. The war in Vietnam in the 1960s overrode the memory of Americans and crowded out the memory of Korea. It was only called a police action, and the extent of the conflict was little known to the public. Actually, think of this. Today we have 130,000 soldiers, sailors, Marines in Iraq. 500,000 Americans served over the years soldiers, sailors, and airmen in Korea. Let's talk about the country. Korea is a country of 23 million people, bordered by China and by the USSR. It's the size of North and South Carolina combined. For centuries, it was a feudal kingdom ruled by a paternalistic Confucian code. A single dynasty ruled the country for 500 years insulated country, unknown to the rest of the world and untouched by the rest of the world. It was a hermit kingdom, and interestingly enough, it was racially homogeneous. There were no outsiders, no ethnicity other than the Koreans, and they were very brilliant people. I'm not sure I'm on solid ground, but I read somewhere that the alphabet as we know it was invented by Koreans. It could not fend for itself. And so it became a Chinese protectorate, and it paid tribute to China for its strength and supervision. In 1884, for the first time, there were contacts with the West, and Presbyterian missionaries arrived. It is now the only Christian nation in Asia. In 1900, the Russians invaded Korea in an effort to have seaports. And they occupied Korea for a relatively short time, but they were driven out by Japan. And this is where our story begins. Driven out by Japan in the Russo-Sinai War in 1906, the Russo-Japanese War. The Japanese, ever since, ruthlessly occupied Korea. It so happened that then US President Theodore Roosevelt brokered the peace treaty between Russia and Japan. And interestingly enough, he received the Nobel Prize for his efforts. Of course, the result was that Japan ruthlessly occupied Korea. You may remember that they used many of the women for comfort girls, and it was a very repressive regime. Korea became a 20th century subject nation. As World War II ended, in the Yalta Conference, the US, England, and Russia decided to take charge of peace and they conquered countries, defeated badly. They needed someone to supervise their recovery from the terrors of World War II. Politically difficult Germany became East and West Germany. Korea, taken from the defeated Japanese, was divided into North Korea for the Russians, their influence and supervision, and South Korea for the United States. To administer the surrender of the Japanese troops, the U.S. and Soviet negotiators hastily agreed in 1945 to divide the peninsula. Dean Russ related that he and a Colonel Bonestiel, late at night in the White House and under great pressure, had to pick a zone for American occupation. In those three computer days, they used a National Geographic magazine map. So little was known about Korea. And they could find no natural dividing line in this long peninsula, this long thumb of a country. 
Then they saw the 38th parallel, and they noticed the capital, Seoul, was below that line in the southern part, and recommended to the state and war departments. They agreed, and surprisingly, so did the Soviets, who absented themselves from the United Nations meeting during the vote. North Korea became militarized on a Soviet model, and they installed a man named Kim Il-sung. He actually was in a Soviet uniform. Let's talk about him. And the reason I make this issue about the country before I get into the war we fought there is because it's at the heart of our problem even today. In the 1930s, Kim Il-sung, a young man, was a communist partisan in China. That was his origin. Of course, he was a Korean, and so he wanted to fight the Japanese and wrest control of Korea from the Japanese. So he fought as a partisan in the forests and in the mountains. He was a Korean, he fought the Japanese occupation. And at the end of World War II, he became a Russian officer. His son, Kim Jong-il, was born in Russia. I mention that because the present-day ruler of Korea, North Korea, is Kim Jong-il, his son. Sung returned to Korea in 1945 after Japan was ousted, and he soon controlled the Workers' Party by way of land reform. He attained ruthless control with no alternatives. They named themselves, happily enough, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the D. P.R.K. South Korea became R.O.K., the Republic of Korea. As time passed, North Korea became militarized on the Soviet model and totally communist. The U.S. supported our own interests in South Korea. Now, when there was a liberation in the five years between World War II and the liberation of South Korea and the North, there was a lot of political activity in South Korea. There were students, it's an intellectual community, and they were leftists, as students almost always are. And on the right were the conservatives in South Korea. The U.S., of course, as I said, support our interests, and they imported a president to run the country. His name was Syngman Rhee. He was an anti-communist. Unfortunately, he was more than 70 years old to begin his reign, and also he had spent at least the last three decades, 30 years, in the United States as a Korean who never really was at home during all those difficult years. You would see his popularity was minimal. American advisors came, as we always do, send advisors to countries that need our support, and they tried to restrain border fights between North and South Korea along this 38th parallel. And so they began to deny arms to the officers and military that was developing in South Korea. Not a good thing. Secretary of State Atchison was contentious of the importance of the United Nations and their control. So he was very anxious to defeat communism at any place in the world. And this seemed to be a good opportunity. He followed Truman's line when Truman became president, the Truman Doctrine, the defense against communism, and particularly in Korea. In June 1950, five years after the end of World War II, the North suddenly attacked the South and claimed that the United States and South Korean forces had attacked them. That was their reason. South Korean troops panicked and fled. Why not? They had poor arms, poor training, and an unpopular government under Syngman Rhee. Since our forces in America have been almost completely demobilized and our weapons have been put into uh, oil and stock to keep them from uh, harm but not to be useful. The U.S. Army had minimal opportunities to have good arms and they retreated with the ROK troops. Although not approved by Congress, the Defense Department or the United Nations, President Harry Truman that day immediately sent troops, air support, and the 7th Fleet. As a matter of fact, the USS New Jersey, of which we're very proud, are built there in the Philadelphia Navy Yard, stood offshore with their 16-inch guns and bombarded 
North Korea. Not to great effect, because the country is very mountainous. It was very hard to find targets. The UN endorsed world action two days later and sent troops. Stalin and the United USSR represented <coughs> exited the UN assembly and boycotted the deliberations, of course. But they did upset themselves, so fortunately the United Nations voted in a body to support UN entry into this war between North and South Korea. Twenty other nations joined the defense, providing a total of 150,000 troops and 100 naval vessels. They were medical units, mostly from countries that were neutral or had been defeated during the war. Denmark sent medical people, Italy, India, Sweden, and Norway. And of course, we sent medical people because I'm an example of that, and I'll tell you why as we get into the meat of the war. By July 30th, only the southern city of Busan, in this thumb of a country, way down by my thumbnail, was all that was left that was free. The rest had been overrun by the North Korean troops. 90% of the country and almost the entire South Korean <coughs> army was lost. General Douglas MacArthur, who suffered himself by having to leave the Philippines during World War II, leave his troops behind for things like the Bataan Death March, had been assigned by President Truman to supervise the Japanese and their defeat on the Japanese home island. And he did a remarkable job in listening to the aid of the emperor and controlling the Japanese people very completely and well. He was based in Japan, and he was placed immediately in command of the troops that we were sending to South Korea. Soon. Almost all the active U.S. Army arrived, and MacArthur had the genius idea to land at a place called Incheon. It was a port midway down this peninsula, behind the North Korean forces. And uh, by the way, the man who arranged that landing at Incheon had very difficult tides, a very difficult place to land. The harbor was very worrisome. It was the same man who supervised the D-Day landings in Normandy. They made a steady advance across the 38th parallel and all the way north. Amazing. They reversed the tide of the war. They captured Pyongyang, which was the capital of the north. And they almost got up to the top of the country, right up here at the end of my thumb, the Yalu River. Y-A-L-U, the border with China. If that sounds ominous, it became so. The U.S led forces might have just as well reestablished the 38th power back where they had been thrown back from. They were way above it now. And made a base at the border and declared communism defeated. But the influence of our presence is great. And Harry Truman said, I'm turning back the communist tide. Stay there. The CIA felt that China and Russia would not openly intervene. Ouch. Six months later, into the fray, the Chinese entered from the north. A million man, so-called volunteer Chinese army, descended on the battlefield, and within two weeks had pushed the UN forces back to the 38th parallel. It was called the worst American defeat since Bull Run. The Chinese had cotton quilted uniforms so thin you could almost see through them, and their shoes were tennis sneakers. But a million men, had their way in some of the memorable battles, including the Marines, many of them dying in a place called Chosan. They called it later Frozen Chosen. President Truman hinted the use of the atomic bomb. The battle raged up and down the peninsula. Seoul, the capital, and you'll see a picture of that later, changed hands five times, often in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Army then experienced a severe shortage of doctors needed for the increasing number of casualties, and that's when they rang my bell. I was called to the Army out of my residency because, like many of the young men with me, we've been excused because we were a medical school or too young to be drafted during World War II. We were called in, three of us, doctors from all over the United States, pulled out of their training. All of us were sent to Fort Sam Houston, Texas for basic medical corps training. 
military knowledge, who to salute, and where to wear the bars, and even basic battlefield training under fire. I'll never forget the sergeant saying, oh, okay, you college boys, line up at groups at three and don't screw it up. But he didn't say screw it up. We all went, oh, mother, oh, what happened? Everybody in suits and ties and white shirts. We learned about field equipment and even foreign disease updates. All of that in six weeks. And there were 300 of us, 100 were sent to uh, Europe, 100 were kept in the U.S. for various army posts, and 100, and me among them, were flown to uh, across the Pacific. In those days, the planes didn't have the capacity we have today, so those prop-driven planes, I had to stop twice, once in Hawaii and once in Wake Island for refueling. We could still see rusted, rusted tanks uh, on the beaches of uh, Wake Island. I was first assigned the 8055 MASH. That was the home of Hawkeye, Hot Lips, and Radar of Radar TV fame. I was a general medical officer. The surgeon Hawkeye, who I knew, his name was Captain Richard Hornberger. And I was able to find a letter that he wrote to his family. And uh, he said, we here at the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital are exposed to extremes, hard work, leisure, tension, boredom, heat, cold, satisfaction and frustration that most of us had never faced before. A few flipped their lids, but most just raised hell. I will spare you the gory details and the body counts and casualties but chronic, I'll chronicle baseball games in ankle deep mud, late night poker marathons, and other diversion when things are slow. Off and on, we get some interesting work to do. Some of it caused by the Chinamen, much of it by our own soldiers being hit by their own mortars, and some by them trying to cross our own minefields. As you may know, after leaving Korea, under the alias Richard Hooker, Hornberger wrote a fictional account of the wartime experiences which became a movie and later a TV series that lasted for 11 years. All doctors there had a rotation home. It wasn't like a war where everybody went as a unit and came home at the end of the war or were relieved. We all went as individuals. And you've got three points for each month on the front line. So after a year, 36 points you were allowed to go home. So I was sent forward to an active military unit to replace a combat physician being rotated home. I was sent to battalion level service, which is as far forward as a doctor is allowed to be placed. Ahead of that, they use corpsmen. I was sent to a field artillery battalion it was um, a 955, it was a Brooklyn National Guard outfit. As you know, very often in wars, National Guardsmen, it's especially true here today in, uh, in Iraq, the National Guard is pressed into service since there is enough active military men to handle it. These guns were 105 millimeter howitzers, and uh, their strength was just short of the 500 men that a battalion requires, so they had no dentist. And I had to do it all, especially extractions, my specialty. My second transfer, when another physician was rotated out, it was to an even closer outfit. It was a Utah National Guard outfit, the 204th Field Artillery Battalion, and they fired 155 mile self propelled long rifles, artillery with a 16 mile range. They were tank mounted. Of course, we never stayed in one place very long because of enemy fire and uh, because of places we were needed as they advanced. I had 15 medical corpsmen and an adopted Korean infant, which we picked up, of which unfortunately there were many in that country. His Korean name was Che sang Oak, but we called him Chester. He was age 11, and we fed him and nourished him and carried him with us much like a mascot. The war progressed. A little known <coughs> fact is that President Truman read an atomic bomb there were nine capsules 
ready in Okinawa in the Pacific if needed. An okay was granted by the Atomic Energy Commission. MacArthur asked permission to use them. He wanted their use, and he wanted to invade mainland China. Truman decided he had to go. He got the joint sheets to have MacArthur dismissed, something you, I'm sure, all remember. He returned to America with much fanfare, but only in a matter of months, he faded away, like all old soldiers. Whatever. Bloody trench warfare set in from 1951 to 1953, along what was then stabilized a little above the 38th parallel. They were some of the bloodiest battles of modern history, and their names have been immortalized, some in fact and some in movie fiction. Pork Chop Hill, Heartbreak Ridge, and Old Baldy. My job was to tend to sick and injured. I was also chemical control officer, sanitation officer, venereal disease advisor, and doctor to all officers and enlisted men in the battalion. Where the GIs found ladies to get venereal disease from, I never found out. <laughs> All serious cases were sent back to the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital behind me, either by a helicopter or by a field ambulance. A truce occurred in the village of Pan Wen Zhang in July 1953. It was an armistice only. Nothing was settled. Talks have continued for the last 55 years, and still 1.2 million North Korean troops are situated there along the 38th parallel. There is no winter, no formal peace treaty, and of course, North Korea of late continues its aggression in many ways, a hidden bestial possibility for our future. Back in 1960, it made an effort to assassinate the South Korean president. In 1968, he captured the USS Pueblo in neutral waters and kept the captain and crew prisoners in terrible conditions for a year. We could not rescue them. In 1992, it parted ways with the International Atomic Energy Commission. In 1993, it refused all inspection and is known to have had anywhere from one or five atomic bombs. Just this last week, they weaponized their plutonium, and they made the impossible request that if they are inspected, they reserve the right to inspect all facilities in South Korea. In 1996, under the despotic regime and unproductive communist ideology, the North had a famine that caused the deaths of three million people in North Korea. 2002, they began pursuing a nuclear weapons program, and in 2003, as I said, North Korea withdrew from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. What we now recognize is that war in Korea militarized the Cold War between us and the Soviets. Within two years after the shock of the June 1950 communist attack, the military budget here in America increased to $500 million. On June 25th, 1960, 1950, there was only one U.S. airman in all of Korea and no serious army bases at all. That lesson laid the groundwork for large standing forces deployed worldwide and enhanced the value of air power. Failure had provided its own share of lessons. 40,000 GIs killed, 100,000 wounded, and one and a half million Korean dead. All of this was a pivotal event of the tumultuous 20th century. The war's aftermath gave a deadly toll of two million Koreans wounded or maimed, orphaned, two-thirds of the civilian population. China's losses were one million. The U.S. had 40,000 deaths, I mentioned 100,000 wounded. Today, 13% of the American veteran population are Korean veterans. I have here, I'd like to show you a few pictures to illustrate some of the things I've talked about. So if we could dead in the lights, I'd appreciate it.
Lights out. This is uh, the plane that flew me from Travis Air Force Base in uh, Northern California to uh, the Far East. As I mentioned, uh, jets were hardly in popularity yet after World War II. And this was the usual mode of national and Pacific transportation. Here we land at Pusan, which is the foot of the island. And uh, this is a, you know, just a, a normal transport ship that took me from Japan to the country of Korea, across the Sea of Japan. These hospital ships, of course, were for the wounded, and there were the step after the match. The step after that was to return to Japan to more superior facilities, and the step after that was to go back to Latterman General Hospital in California. You're out of focus? Tell me if I can correct it. Say when. Is that it? Say when. Is that it? Good. Okay. Fine. Thank you. This is our first view of the country that we're fighting. And you'll notice that, if that's out, let me know. You'll notice that uh, this country was quite backward. It's unrecognizable now. I'll tell you more about it. But this is exactly the way it was. Uh, this is Pusan at the bottom. And this is the kind of folks we saw in native dress, naked children, small houses. The very first thing they did was to educate the GIs that came with, that uh, had arrived by ship, that this is the kind of mountainous country they would be dealing with. The North was extremely mountainous. They were a mechanized group, a much more aggressive people. The people in the South, by nature, were uh, agrarian, rice paddies. And uh, they had mountains, but nothing to compare to the north. So this is a, an introduction to a, a halfway world between the rice paddies they would encounter and the mountains in the north. This is the second city I was to. It's the city of Tegu. It was about halfway up the peninsula. And there you see these, uh, a rock soldier. And you see an A-frame behind him in which they transported the goods. And uh, it was a teeming, tumultuous country. And as I said, few automobiles. It's another world of 50 years ago. This is a typical street in Tegu, which is the second largest city. Open sewer on the right, poor sanitation. And I picked up a girl that's called hemorrhagic fever there, which is a common disease in the Far East. Put me in the hospital. It's a kidney injury, but all got better. This is another example I told you about orphanages. You became a parent at age eight. Because they, they gave me your brother or baby sister to take care of. This is the uh, classical agrarian people with babies on their backs and uh, a very devout Christian society, a very controlled one and a very nice one. This is the kind of uh, houses they live in the farming areas. This is the capital soul. If you look closely, you can see it's got lots of scaffolding because it had been over so many times. This is a scene in the city, which was a lot of rubble. And then uh, I got the message to move forward to the outfit I was going to be serving with, that thing on the right of the steering wheel of the Jeep that was transporting me. And this is the 38th parallel. They issued sidearms to the doctor, but we'll probably end up shooting ourselves <coughs> in the foot. That's me. <coughs> Mines warned us that we were coming close to serious, serious danger. This is the area that South Korea looked like, lots of rice paddies. And I must put an honest statement here that we also contribute to genocide in our own way. Our Air Force bombed so many dams in North Korea and released so much water that 70% of the rice paddies were flooded in North Korea. Be probably none of the soldiers, but the civilians of their rice and food and there was some famine there too, nothing to do with the control of the uh, King Jong Il regime. This is the forward tanks monitoring the battle, which is up ahead where the snow line is. Moving forward, the yellow markers, of course, identify them for safety to our own, from our own to our own aircraft. This is the Mash Hospital 8055, and of course, it doesn't look like it did in the movies, but if you're in showbiz, you say it's delighting. 
this is a few of the doctors that are meeting there because it was the really only important medical connection we had. Most of us, I'll show you later, and nothing but our hands and a stethoscope and a couple of small pieces of equipment. This was also the place where the doctors from every nation met to confer on the decisions in medical care and what antibiotics and what treatments we should use to conform to the military. If you look closely, you'll see doctors from Turkey, Sweden, England, and so on. Now I'm being moved up to the front. These are the GIs going forward. And I'm assigned to this field artillery battalion. They had three batteries, which meant that we were, even though there were 16 guns, that each battery was moved to a different place, so I couldn't be everywhere. So for help, I had this motley group of medical corpsmen, and there was Chester in the front to our right. And they were my eyes and ears, and they would report back and bring people back. This is the first aid tent that they moved to put up whenever we had to resettle. And this is my interior equipment, bare, bare floor and just hands and knees. This is my bathroom, officers only. <laughs> and here's the bathroom where we bathed with our bare behinds when the weather permitted. The summers weren't too bad. This is the outfit, the 105.5s, and of course there's an awful lot of ear injury because they fire day and night, and they, uh, what they did was they load the, the breech with a bag of black powder, and then a 45 caliber bullet was put in the back, and the projector went in the front, these are the projectiles on the ground on the right, and uh, when they pulled the lanyard, the 45 caliber bullet was hit in the back, it exploded into the bag of black powder and sent the projectile, that's the one up front. And the projectiles had different heads. If you can look closely, you'll see there are screw-up heads with a hook there, and they could be either explode on impact or something called VT fuses, where they would get about 100 yards close to the ground and explode, killing everybody uh, within a football field range. This is the forward observation post. We had, I was allowed up there very rarely, and we could observe the enemy, and they would fire either the direction control will tell them to move backward, move forward, advance 100 yards. We also had a light plane that flew over the enemy and directed the fire. This is the helicopter we used for evacuation. This is the winter scene, and the country was very cold in the winter. 20 below was not unusual. And uh, here I am doing something as how cold it was. The tents were full of snow and ice. This is the picture of the static war, and these are the mountains that, that they fought inches. Most of the tops, all the trees were broken off by artillery fire, mostly ours. This is one of our planes flying over, usually to drop uh, some help. This is battlefield promotions and medals. This is the outfit I ended up in. It was the 204th in the National Guard outfit, wonderful men. Some of them had several grandmothers, of course. And uh, these guns fired 16 miles, and they were deafening day and night, day and night. The guys holding a hand over his ears didn't help much. I had a fair amount of ruptured eardrums. This is the night fire. This is the chaplain conducting Sunday morning Catholic mass. And when I got home, the first place I went was to the UN see what it was all about, and see what they had to say. And here's the Security Council meeting, which I listened to with headphones. You can put the lights on, please. In conclusion, I just want to say that there was no winner. North Korea is the most closed country in the world. It's still a threat. And South Korea has changed. It's vibrant, successful. They had their own Marshall Plan by the money that the Japanese paid them in reparations. 